Welcome everyone. I am Dr. Shonendu Roy, Assistant Professor of the Department of Botany, University of North Bengal. I will be presenting a video lecture on the common non-parametric test. As all of you are aware that to make the generalization about the population from the sample, statistical tests are used. A statistical test is a formal technique that relies on the probability distribution for reaching the conclusion concerning the reasonableness of the hypothesis. This hypothetical testing related to differences are classified as parametric and non-parametric test. In this video lecture, first of all, we will be discussing the basic differences between the parametric and non-parametric test, the conditions in which this test should be applied, and later on, we will be discussing two commonly used non-parametric tests that is the chi-square test and the sine test. So let us begin. With so let us first try to understand the basic difference between a parametric test and a non-parametric test. A parametric test is one which has information about the population parameter. The parametric test is the hypothesis test which provides generalizations for making statements about the mean of the parent population. A t-test based on student's t-statistic which is often used in this regard. The t-statistics rest on the underlying assumption that there is the normal distribution of variable and the mean is known or assumed to be known. The population variance is calculated for the sample and it is assumed that the variables of interest in the population are measured on an interval scale. On the other hand, the non-parametric test is one where the researcher has no idea regarding the population parameter. The non-parametric test is defined as the hypothesis test which is not based on underlying assumptions that is it does not require population's distribution to be denoted by specific parameters. The test is mainly based on differences in the median values. Hence it is alternately known as the distribution free test. The test assumes that the variables are measured on a nominal or ordinal level instead of the interval or scale level. It is used when the independent variables are non-metric. In other words, when the data is generated from a process or model that is known except for finite number of unknown parameters, the model is called a parametric model. Otherwise, the model is called a non-parametric model. The statistical techniques that assume a non-parametric model are called non-parametric. So before going into the details of non-parametric test, let us discuss about the fundamental differences between the parametric and non-parametric test. In the parametric test, the test statistic is based on distribution, whereas on the other hand, the test statistic is arbitrary in case of the non-parametric test. In the parametric test, it is assumed that the measurement of variable of interest is done on interval or ratio level as opposed to the non-parametric test wherein the variable of interest are measured on the nominal or ordinal scale. In general, the measure of the central tendency is the parametric test is mean while in the case of non-parametric test, it is median. In the parametric test, there is complete information about the population. Conversely, in the non-parametric test, there is no information about the population. The applicability of the parametric test is for variables only, whereas non-parametric test applies to both variables and attributes. For measuring the degrees of association between the two quantitative variables, Pearson's correlation coefficient is used in the parametric test, while Spearman's rank correlation is used in the non-parametric test. If you assume that your data has come from a normal distribution with mean which is denoted as mu and standard deviation which is denoted as sigma, then the data is generated from process or a model that is known except for the two parameters that is its mean and standard deviation. In that case, the model is called a parametric model. For example, height is roughly a dis normal distribution in that if you were to graph height from a group of people, you would see a typical bell-shaped curve. 
This distribution is also called Gaussian distribution. Typically, parametric tests are in general more powerful, that is, it requires a smaller sample size than the non parametric test. A normal distribution, sometimes called the bell curve, so this curve is called the bell curve. It is a distribution that occurs naturally in many situations. For example, the bell curve is seen in tests like SAT and GRE or any type of competitive examination. The bulk of the students will score the average C. So this is the average value. While smaller number of students will score a B or D, that means they have scored a average number in the competitive test and a even smaller percentage of the student will score E and A which denotes very less number. So this bell curve is symmetrical that means the half of the data will fall to the left and the half of the data will fall to the right. Many groups follow this type of pattern like heights of pupil, blood pressure, IQ scores, salaries etc. The normal distribution is also called the Gaussian distribution and it is characterized by unimodal distribution which is symmetric so you can see that it is symmetric in nature and it also contains similar type of asymptote at both the ends so this is the asymptote the distribution is also characterized by close occurrence of the values of mean median and mode so ideally in this case of distribution the values of mean and median and mode are very close to each other so in which cases the non parametric test will be applicable so the non parametric test as you know are about 95% as popular as the parametric test but we have already discussed that the parametric tests are more powerful than the non parametric test however non parametric tests are often necessary some common situation for using non parametric test are when the distribution is not normal that means the distribution is skewed the distribution is not known or the sample size is too small. That means for a sample size of smaller than 30, the non-parametric test is applicable. Also, if there are extreme values or outliers, that means the values are clearly out of range, the non-parametric test should be used. Non-parametric statistics does not assume that the data is normally distributed or quantitative. In that regard, Non-parametric statistics would estimate the shape of distribution itself instead of in estimating the individual mu and the sigma, that is the mean and the standard deviation. There are two main types of non-parametric statistical methods. In the first method, it seeks to discover the unknown underlying distribution of the observed data, while the second method attempts to make a statistical inference regarding the underlying distribution. Let us assume that a researcher is interested in estimating the number of babies born with jaundice in the state of California. An analysis of the data set may be performed by taking a sample of 5000 babies. An estimate of the entire population of babies bearing jaundice born in the following year is the derived measurement. For a second case, consider two groups of different researchers. They are interested in knowing whether blanket marketing or commercial marketing is associated with how fast a company gains brand positioning. Assuming that the sample size is chosen randomly, is distribution regarding how fast a company realizes a brand positioning can be assumed to be normal. Nevertheless, an experiment that measures the company's strategic goals to address market dynamics, which also determines the positioning of the brand, cannot be assumed to take on a normal distribution. So therefore, we should use non-parametric test in this case. The main idea behind the phenomenon is that randomly selected data may contain factors such as market dynamics. At the other extreme, if factors such as market segment and competition come into play, the company's strategic objectives are not likely to impact the sample size. Such an approach is effective when the data lacks a clear numerical interpretation. For example, test on whether customer prefer a particular product because of its nutritional value may include ranking its metrics as strongly agree, agree, indifferent, disagree and strongly disagree. In such a scenario, a non-parametric method always comes in handy. 
Now, so these are the rule of thumb for the use of parametric statistics and non-parametric statistics. For nominal scales or ordinal scales, we should always use or prefer non-parametric statistics. So I think all of you are aware of nominal scale and ordinal scale or interval or ratio scales. So basically the nominal scale is used to label variables in different classification and does not imply a quantitative value or order. Similarly, ordinal scale is used to represent non-mathematical ideas such as frequency, satisfaction, a degree of pain, etc. On the other hand, for interval scales or ratio scale, we always use parametric statistics. So the interval scale is defined as a numerical scale where the order of the variables as well as the differences between the variables is known. Ratio scale on the other hand is a variable measurement scale that not only produces the order of variables but also makes the difference between the known variables along with information about the value of the true zero. Other factors that indicates that a non-parametric test should be used include that one or more assumption of a parametric test have been violated. That means either the bell shaped curve is not there. So in that case, the non-parametric test can be used. Either your sample size is too small to run a parametric test. Either your data has outliers that cannot be removed or you want to test for the median rather than the mean. So in this case, you might want to do this if you have a very skewed distribution. So this is the hierarchy of the hypothesis test. So there are different tests which can either uh, predict for the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So the hypothesis tests are basically differentiated into parametric and non-parametric tests and both the parametric and the non-parametric tests are again divided into one sample test and two sample tests. So a one sample test is used to compare the group mean to a standard or reference value of the population. Whether, whereas a two sample test is a method used to test whether the unknown population means of the two groups are equal or not. On the other hand, pair test compares scores on two different variables but for the same group of cases. Whereas independent samples test compares scores on the same variable but for two different group of cases. There are several tests which are indicated here that can be used for the one sample parametric test and the two sample parametric test. So these uh, examples are already here. So you can uh, uh, get from the uh, uh, diagram that which type of test can be used for one sample test, parametric test, two sample parametric test and in the same way for one sample non-parametric test and two sample non-parametric test. But there are several tests which can be used equivalently in case of parametric and non-parametric models. For example, instead of the parametric test, independent sample t-test, Mann-Whitney test can be used if the data is non-parametric. Similarly, Wilcoxon signed rank test can be used in place of paired sample t-test. Kruskal-Wallis test can be used in place of one-way analysis of variance and Friedman's ANOVA in, can be used in place of one-way repeated measures analysis of variance. To make a choice between parametric and the non-parametric test is not an easy task for researchers and it is very difficult to decide which particular test can be used for a particular statistical analysis. For performing hypothesis, if the information about the population is completely known by the way of parameters, then the parametric test can be used and any of the tests can be selected on the basis of the uh, sample data. Whereas if there is no knowledge about the population and it is needed to test the hypothesis on population, then the, this type of non-parametric test can be used on the basis of the distribution of the data. So now we will discuss about the two commonly used non-parametric tests that is the chi-square test which can be used uh, for both one sample and two sample non-parametric test and the sign test. So these two tests will be discussed in details and the method of their calculation and interpretation will also be discussed in the uh, next few slides. So let us first discuss about the chi-square test which is the most commonly used non-parametric test. 
a chi-square test is a hypothesis testing method and two commonly used chi-square tests are the chi-square goodness of fit test and chi-square test of independence. Chi-square requires no assumption about the shape of the population distribution from which a sample is drawn. If you have a single measurement variable, you can use a chi-square goodness of fit test and if you have two measurement variables, you can use a chi-square test of independence. However, there are other chi-square tests, but these two tests are the most commonly used. You can use a chi-square test for hypothesis testing about whether your data is as expected. The basic idea behind the test is to compare the observed values in your data to the expected value that you would see if the null hypothesis is true. For both the chi-square goodness of fit test and the chi-square test of independence, you can perform the same analysis steps. So basically the steps are same which I have noted below. So the first step would be to define the null and the alternative hypothesis before collecting your data. So that means you have to define a null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. The next step would be to decide on the alpha value or the p-value which involves deciding the risk you are willing to take of drawing the wrong conclusion. For example, if you suppose you set a value of alpha is equal to 0 0.05 when testing for independence or goodness of fist, then you have decided on a 5% risk of concluding the two variables are independent when in reality they are not. After that, you have to check for the data if there are any errors or not. The next step would be to check for the assumption for the test. And lastly, you have to perform the test and draw your conclusion. So both the chi-square test in the disconnection involve calculating a test statistic. The basic idea behind the test is to compare the actual data values with what would be expected if the null hypothesis is true. So all these things we will be discussing in details in the calculation part. So basically the test statistics involves finding the squared differences between the actual and the expected data values and dividing that difference by the expected data values. Then you have to compare the test statistic to a theoretical value from the chi-square distribution. And after that, the theoretical value depends on both the alpha value and the degrees of the freedom of your data. So uh, let us first focus upon the goodness of fit and we will be discussing in details about the calculation of the goodness of fit. So first of all, what is goodness of fit? Goodness of fit refers to how close the observed data are to those predicted from the hypothesis. The chi-square test does not prove that a hypothesis is correct. It only evaluates to what extent the data and the hypothesis have a good fit. The basic idea behind the test is that when you compare the actual data values with what would be expected if the null hypothesis is true, the test statistics involves finding the squared differences between the actual and the expected data values and dividing that difference by the expected data values. You do this for each data point and add up the values. After that, you compare the test statistic to a theoretical value from the chi-square distribution table the theoretical value depends on both the alpha value and the degrees of the freedom of your data. For the goodness of fit test, you need one variable. So that means any uh, categorical data having only one variable can be applied to the goodness of fit test. In this case, you also need an idea or hypothesis about how that variable is distributed and most importantly, to apply the goodness of the fit test to data set, you need data values that are simply random sample from the full population. Your data should be categorical or nominal data. The chi-squared goodness of fit test is not appropriate for the continuous data. It only is applicable for the categorical or nominal data. So that is why it is a non-parametric test. A data set that is large enough so that at least five values are expected in each of the observed data categories. So, data categories. So, all these are the prerequisites for performing a goodness of fit test. So, let us take an example for the calculation of the chi-square test. So, we will see that how your expected and observed values are determined and how the differences are determined and how the calculation of the chi-square test is done. So, as an example, uh, here we are taking the Mendelian dihybrid ratio 
as the example for the chi-square test for the calculation of the goodness of fit. So you know that the dihybrid cross is a cross between two individuals who differ in two observed traits that are controlled by two distinct genes. If the two parents are homozygous for both genes, then the F1 generation of the offspring will be uniformly heterozygous for both the genes and will display the dominant phenotype for both traits. In this case, the phenotypic ratio of the F2 offspring of the cross is 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. So this 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 ratio is the Mendelian dihybrid ratio as all of us know and this is the expected values in a population. So this 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 means that out of the 16 individuals, 9 of the F2 individuals which possess the dominant genotype for both the traits and only 1 out of the 16 are recessive for both the traits and the rest 3 plus 3 are heterozygous for the traits. Okay, let's take an example for understanding the goodness of fit and the calculation of the goodness of fit in more details. So in this case, we have taken a very common example of the Mendelian dihybrid cross. So in the following case, the example of pea plant seed is chosen and the two characteristics being compared are the shape and color. So in this case, the shape of the uh, seeds are round and wrinkled and the color is yellow and green. So as you know that the capital R which uh, codes for roundness is dominant and Y which codes for yellow color of the seeds is a dominant trait between these uh, characters. So this implies that capital R and a small r will be a round seed and capital Y small y will be a yellow seed. So only a small r small r will be wrinkled seed and small y small y will be a green seed. So all these things we already know about the dihybrid cross. So basically in the dihybrid cross the genes are on the separate chromosomes and each allele pair showed independent segregation. So if the first filial generation produces four identical offspring, the second filial generation which occurs by crossing the members of the first filial generation shows a phenotypic appearance or ratio of 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. So the 9 represents the proportion of individuals displaying both the dominant traits. The first 3 represents the individuals displaying the first dominant trait and the second recessive trait. The second 3 represents those displaying the first recessive trait and the second dominant trait. And the last 1 represents the homozygous displaying the both the recessive traits. So therefore, the ratio of 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 represents the expected ratio of the phenotypes of seeds in the population. So here also this table also showed shows the expected ratio. So you can see that the expected ratio is calculated like this. So in a, the total number of seeds is 556. So we can easily calculate the expected ratio of the seeds uh, by finding the ratio of the 556. So you can see that 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. So very simply we can uh, divide this 9 by 16 into 556. We can calculate the expected values of round yellow seeds to be 312.75. Similarly, the expected values of round and green seeds to be 104.25. Then the wrinkled yellow seeds to be 104.25. And similarly, the wrinkled green seeds is to be 34.75. So I think that this calculation is very simple and very um, easy for you to understand. So like this, you can calculate the expected values that is actually expected from the population of 556 seeds. However, in the actual scenario, this ratio can differ in a given set of seed samples. That's, that means if you have randomly taken 556 seed uh, sample, so this 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 ratio can differ. So in this case, so this is the observed values that we have uh, taken for the example. So in this example, the observed values of the phenotypes of a total sample of 556 seeds is taken as the observed value. So in this case, you can see that clearly the observed values are different from the expected value, expected values. So in this case, you can see the number of round yellow seed is 315, round green seed is 108, wrinkled yellow seed is 101, and wrinkled green seed is 32. Okay, so I, this, uh, I think this is the clear. So I think uh, it is uh, very clear too that what is the difference between the observed value and the expected value. And in this case, so there are four categories. One, two, three, and four. Now, before starting with the goodness of the fit, first you have to state the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. 
So in this case, the chi-square test or the statistic is used in genetics to illustrate if there are deviations from the expected outcomes of the alleles in a population. So the general assumption of any statistical test is that there is no significant deviation between the measured result and the predicted ones. So this lack of deviation is called the null hypothesis. So that means in this case we can state a hypothesis that null hypothesis that there is no significant deviation between the measured result and the predicted ones. Okay, so the alternative hypothesis will be just the opposite of the null hypothesis. So where we can state that there is a significant deviation or difference between the measured result and the predicted ones. So if the chi-square statistic value is greater than the value at a specific probability, then the null hypothesis has been rejected and the significant deviation from the predicted value is observed. Now, for the calculation of the goodness of the fit, we can follow the uh, following steps step by step so first uh, you can uh, prepare a table by you have to fill in the observed category with the appropriate counts then fill in the expected ratio with either 9 by 16 3 by 16 or 1 by 16 as we have already seen we have already done this observed category and expected ratio we have already found out so the next step will be to calculate the observed minus expected square of the observed minus expected divided by expected for each of the phenotype combination after that, you have to add all the values of this individual observed minus expected whole square divided by expected to generate the chi-square value and compare with the value of the table where your degree of freedom will be 3. So how we find out the degree of freedom? So degree of freedom because there are only 4 categories. So you can uh, simply find out the degree of freedom by n minus 1 that is a 4 minus 1 is equal to 3. The final step will be the rejection or acceptance of the null hypothesis. So this is the formula of the degrees of the freedom. So you can simply find out the degree of the freedom by this formula n minus 1 where n is equal to the number of the categories. So in this case you already have seen that there are the four categories. So the degree of freedoms will be 3. So this is the calculation table. So this table depicts the observed values and the expected values of the example we have already discussed about. So this is the observed minus expected values. So simply you subtract the observed values uh, and the expected values O minus E. So you will get these values. So in this case you can see that these values uh, may be either positive or negative values. So that is why for the uniformity we take the square of these values so that all the values uh, appear in positive. So that it gives equal importance to all the categories. After this, we individually calculate the values of the observed minus expected whole square for all the categories and divide them with the expected values of the individual categories. So in this case, you can see, for example, for the round yellow sets, so this is the observed uh, minus expected whole square value divided by the expected value. So like this, you will find out the individual values uh, for the round yellow sets to be 0 0.016, round green sets to be 0 0.135, wrinkled yellow sets to be 0 0.101, and wrinkle green seeds to be 0 0.218. After that, you uh, take the summation of all the individual observed minus expected whole square values by the expected. So we have already found out these values. So we simply add up all these uh, four uh, categorical values and this will give the chi-square value. So the chi-square value for this uh, goodness of fit uh, table is 0.47. So in this slide, you can see how a chi-square distribution table look like. So this is the chi-square distribution table. So this, this is the tabular chi-square value from which you have to find out the tabulated chi-square value. So the calculated chi-square value is to be matched with the tabular values after the calculation has been done. By statistical convention, we always take 0.05 probability level as our critical value. So these are the different probability levels. So for the sake of our calculation, so 0.05 level is taken. So you can take any other levels depending upon your requirement. So if the calculated chi-square value is less than the tabular chi-square value at alpha or p value of 0.05, we accept the null hypothesis. So you can see in this case, the calculated chi-square value is 0.47 that we have already calculated. And in this case, from the table, the tabular chi-square value is 7.815 at this particular value. So you can see the degree of freedom is 3 and this is the probability level or the alpha level 0.05. So this is the your tabulated chi-square value. So in this case, you can clearly see that the calculated chi-square value 
is less than the tabular chi-square value. So in this case, the null hypothesis is accepted. So null hypothesis is accepted means that in our example, the calculated chi-square value is less than the tabular chi-square value at alpha 0.05. Therefore, the null hypothesis is accepted and the data fits the 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 Mendelian ratio. That means there is no difference or no deviation between the expected and the observed value. So before we move further, let us discuss briefly about the chi-square distribution table. The chi-square distribution table is a table that shows the critical values of the chi-square distribution. To use the chi-square distribution table, you only need to know two values the degrees of freedom for the chi-square test and the alpha level for the test. So the common choices of the alpha levels are, uh, can be 0 0.01, 0 0.05 and 0 0.10. But by convention, we always or in most of the cases, we take alpha level as 0 0.05. The chi-square distribution is a probability density function whose values ranges from 0 to positive infinity. So that means the chi-square distribution cannot be negative. So all the values of chi-square will always be positive. So it can range up to positive infinity. So thus, unlike the normal distribution or T value, the function approaches the horizontal axis asymptotically only at the right hand tail of the curve, not at both the tails. The distributions are positively skewed. The research hypothesis for the chi-square is always a one-tailed test. So the chi-square values are always positive. The minimum possible value is zero with no upper limit to its maximum value. As the number of the degrees of freedom increases, the chi-square distribution becomes more symmetrical. So here you can see in this figure that how when the degrees of the freedom increases. So this is the degrees of freedom too. So you can see that uh, this, this is also a one-tailed, positively one-tailed uh, chi-square distribution. But it is not uh, symmetric like, the, uh, like when the degrees of freedom is 10. So in case of the degrees of freedom of 10, the chi-square distribution is uh, positively squared. Uh, that is one tail value, but it is somewhat symmetrical in nature. So that means when the degrees of freedom increases, the chi-square distribution becomes symmetrical towards the one tailed and it is always positive. Now, before moving further, we will uh, briefly discuss about the chi-square test for independence. So we are not going into the calculation part in details. Uh, so we will only discuss uh, the basic aspect of the chi-square test of independence. The chi-square test for independence compares two set of categories to determine whether the two groups are distributed differently among the categories. So as with the goodness of fit example in the previous section, the key idea of the chi-square test for independence is a comparison of observed and the expected values. It is important to keep in mind that the chi-square test for independence only tests whether two variables are independent or not, and it cannot address questions of which is greater or less. A typical example for this test would be in social science research, where researchers are interested in finding factors which are related, example, education and income, occupation and prestige, age and voting behavior, etc. The test procedure follows the same process as the goodness of fit, like formulation of null hypothesis, calculating the difference between the observed and expected values, testing the null hypothesis, and so on. So we are not going into the details of the calculation part, which is more or less same with slight differences. So if you are interested to know in more details, you can mail me to the email address provided at the end of this video lecture. So let us now try to understand the other non-parametric test, that is the sign test. Sign test is a non-parametric test that is used to test whether or not two groups are equally sized. The sign test is used when dependent samples are ordered in pairs where the bivariate random variables are mutually independent. It is based on the direction of the plus and minus sign of the observation and not on their numerical magnitude. It is also called the binomial sign test with p is equal to 0.05. The sign test tests the pair value below or above the median and it does not measure the pair difference. The sign test is an alternative to one sample t-test or a paired t-test. For example, if you want to see that which product of soda, either Pepsi or Coke, is preferred among a group of consumers. Or if you want to test that which drug is more effective 
among a group of consumers. So in this case, you can perform a sign test where your data does not take the shape of a normal distribution. So before going into the details of sign test, let us assume that the observations in a sample of size n are x1, x2 and xn like this. So these observations could be paired differences and in this case the null hypothesis is that that the population median is equal to some value m. So let us take that the median value of the population as m and let us suppose that r plus of the observations are greater than the median value that is m and r minus are the number of observations that are smaller than the median value that is m. Also the values of x which are exactly equal to m are ignored and the sum of r plus and r minus may therefore be less than the actual number of observations that is n and we can denote this uh, number of observation as n dash. So for the sign test we also formulate the null hypothesis in a way that the null hypothesis is expected to be the half of the x number of observations to be above the median and the half below. Therefore under the null hypothesis both r plus and r minus follow a binomial distribution with p is equal to 1 by 2 and n is equal to n dash. Now for the calculation of the sign test or uh, to determine the sign test this steps can be followed. So the number one step would be to choose the r value so which uh, determines uh, the r value is actually the uh, maximum of either the r minus or the r plus. So the r minus is the uh, negative difference and the r plus is the positive difference. So now in the second step you can use the table of binomial distribution to find the probability of observing the value of r or higher assuming p is equal to 1 by 2 and n is equal to n dash. So if the test is one sided so the, uh, the p value that you obtain from the binomial distribution table will be your p value. But if your test is a two sided test so you have to multiply the value that you obtain in uh, the uh, second case uh, by 2 to obtain the p value. Now let us take an example very uh, easy and very common example to understand the sign test. So in this table you can see that uh, there are two drugs drug A and drug B and this actually represents so this there are 12 observations 12 uh, patients maybe so this uh, individual observation they represents and the hours of relief that are provided by these two analgesic drugs. So all these data they show the actual or the approximate number of hours and that are actually required for these two drugs uh, to provide the relief to the patients for, from arthritis. So these are noted here. So you can see different values for the drug relief. So these all these are the relief uh, hours of the drug A and these are the relief hours of the drug B. Now. Uh, before beginning uh, the sign test, uh, you should formulate a null hypothesis. So in this case, the null hypothesis is that that the median difference is zero. So the alternative hypothesis would be that the median difference is not equal to zero. So in this table, uh, you can see that this is the same table that we have uh, taken in the previous slide as an example. So here the table represents the actual difference between the relief hours provided by the two drugs A and B. A and B. So here simply the values of A is subtracted from the values of B to get either positive or negative values. So you can see that if you subtract 3.5 uh, minus 2 you will get 1.5. Similarly you can see negative values also 2.4 minus 2.6 is minus 0.2. So in this way you will get the differences of the two drugs and some values will be in positive and some values will be in negative. Now in this case uh, you can simply calculate the median values by arranging the difference values in the ascending order. So you can arrange this in the ascending order and you can uh, use the formula for the calculation of the median for the 
uh, even number of observations so you know how to calculate the uh, median for the even number of observations so like this you can find the median as 1.65 hours so this represents that uh, the median difference or the median hours that is required for providing relief is actually 1.65 hours also you have already seen that uh, you have got uh, uh, nine positive values so that's why r plus will be is equal to nine and three negative values so that's why r minus will be equal to three so now if you want to calculate the r of the sign test so r is actually the maximum of either your r minus and r plus so in this case so the maximum positive and negative sign is nine positive sign so here the r value of the sign test uh, comes out to be as nine now for the calculation of the two-sided p value based upon the r max and the uh, p value that is 1 by 2 so you can simply calculate the two-sided p value in the microsoft excel and in the microsoft excel you can follow these particular steps for the calculation of the two-sided p value so step by step you can choose the analyze option from the microsoft excel after that you can select the non-parametric test after that you can select two related samples because here we have taken two samples two categories now after this you can specify which two variables comprise your pairs of observation for the calculation and under the test type you have to select the sign test after that you uh, click the ok button and after that your test will be run so in this slide you can see that how your output will appear after you have run the sign test so the output uh, looks something like this here you will get the frequencies in the form of the uh, difference values between the drug b and the drug a so you have already seen that there are three negative values and nine positive values and in total the number of uh, observations that is the n is equal to 12. so here the test statistics it uh, represents that the exact uh, your significance or the two-tailed value to be 0 0.146 so the p-value uh, according to the sign test comes out to be 0 0.146 so now how can you make an inference about the sign test so to make a conclusion we need to find the p-value which in this case has been already found to be 0.146 as discussed in the previous slide so it is the probability of seeing what we see or something more extreme given the null hypothesis is true. Ideally, equal number of positive and negative values should be distributed across the median value, which is 1.65 hours in case of this example that we have taken. So this depicts a binomial distribution in the form of plus and minus sign. However, in this example, the expected p-value is uh, half or 1 by 2 or 0.5. For the plus and the minus values, which is less than the 0.146 which comes out from the sign test from the binomial distribution table so therefore uh, after uh, the uh, end of the sign test we can conclude that there is no evidence for a difference between the two treatments or the two drugs so this is the inference of the sign test so this is all about the non-parametric test so commonly we have discussed about the chi squared test and the sign test so there are other tests also that we have discussed in this presentation but due to the limitation of time uh, we could not actually discuss about the other test in details but if you are interested and if you have any queries regarding this video lecture so you can mail your queries to this email id so you can note down this email id and in case of any queries any sort of uh, Difficulty in understanding also, you can mail your questions or you can mail your uh, queries to this email ID. So, we have come to the end of this lecture. So, thank you. So, I hope that uh, you have understand the basic aspects of the non-parametric test. And I think it is now clear that what are the basic differences between parametric and non-parametric test and which, in which circumstances actually you can conduct a non-parametric test. Thank you.